almost done. to our City Commission study session. Please turn off all cell phones and so, you know, since we are being recorded. Um, first item on the agenda, Leavenworth Soccer Association Agreement Review. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Commissioners. This is the agreement that the city has with the Leavenworth Soccer Association. It goes clear back um, to the mid-90s. Uh, the Soccer Association is an all-volunteer organization. They basically run our soccer program for the community. Back in the day, these were spread out all over, all over the city, um, you may remember, and then now it's all been consolidated to the 10th Avenue Park area once we built the, the soccer complex out there. Uh, like I said, they're an all-volunteer organization. Um, they, they operate uh, spring and uh, fall seasons as well as three summer camps uh, throughout the year. And then, uh, you may recall in the past, they've had the prison break uh, soccer tournament that was uh, highly successful, uh, bringing in over, over 100 teams uh, to the community uh, for a weekend soccer tournament. They, they went a few years without having that tournament and then they brought it back last year. Um, they didn't have quite the numbers last year that they had in the past. They still had over 50 teams and they're looking to kind of build that back up one of those things people get on their on their radar and, and you know schedule every year so um, the, as far as the agreement is concerned we want to bring it forth to you today I'm not sure it's come to the Commission in the past it's a like I said we go date clear back to the the 90s with this it is a three-year agreement uh, it is due up uh, the end this current agreement is due to the end of July expires the end of July so the uh, Lemur Soccer Association has until the first of July to uh, provide in writing to the city any changes or modifications that they would like to see going forward. So, uh, and then at that point, uh, we will review it, uh, review the uh, agreement, and then bring it back uh, to the commission uh, for final approval. So, uh, with that, uh, I, Charity Briggs is the president of LSA. She's out of town and was unable to be here tonight. Uh, so I will open up the discussion and try and answer any questions you may have on their behalf or on, on the city. The, the reason we're bringing it is it, it really needs to be approved by the commission, a contract okay. between the city and the association, and we just haven't done that in the past. So when Steve told me the three-year renewal was up, and I just didn't want to bring it to a regular meeting without, you know, since we've never done it before. So okay. that's what okay. we're trying to study session. Okay. Does Parks have any, any problems that they want to talk about? Have they had any problems with the soccer we haven't. We've had a good working relationship with them. Uh, the only complaint that our office has received is um, them not answering their phones like they want. And, and it's a, like I said, it's an all-volunteer organization. You know, they call down to our office and they get a live voice. Well, these people all work. You know, so they they return mm -hmm. calls. You guys work for them. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We do. Just. Uh, um, but so um, that. Other than that, we've had a great working relationship, uh, especially from a maintenance standpoint. As you know, I was a superintendent for years, and we were able to, able to, the new game fields are some of the best fields, and not, you know, in, in the KC metro area, and, and it's been with the LSA support of just utilizing those for game fields. We don't, they don't even practice on them. Um, we obviously do a high level of maintenance to them as far as aerating and weed control and, and all of that but then they they coordinate really well with us as far as taking care of them you know not playing on them when we get a lot of rain right. things like that which is really just really tears them up so. on the on the fees in here it's, it's it has the, the past fees are any of those changing or are they staying the same we as far as their annual amount that they pay the city we anticipate uh, it's been increasing uh, by $500 over the past several years. And okay. it, obviously what we're trying to do is recoup some of our maintenance costs. Mm -hmm. That'll probably be a discussion 
based on um, what LSA sees going forward and then and then city staff discussion. Okay. Uh, I, I, I assume that we will continue to go up. We've been tr kind of playing catch up on that, um, mm -hmm. but going up $500 every year for the past six years, but I think it was more catch up than, than anything because I think it was extremely low in the past. Okay. Do you see any other perceived changes in this um, format of this contract? That you're looking at? Not really. Uh, they, they they run the concessions um, at the uh, at the complex. They do all the permitting and get all the food handling license and all the state permits and everything for that, and then uh, give us 15 percent on that. That's good. We also, uh, when they do have the uh, the tournaments or or anything outside of regular league play, we do charge 50 dollars per field per day. Um, the, the tournament they had last year, it was an additional $900 to the, to the Parks and Rec Department, which, which helps the offset. Obviously, we do all the, the, the painting and, and lining and everything and for, those, for the tournament as well. So. Okay. What age group is the youngest one the oldest? U6 uh, uh, is, is the, the lowest one, and it goes clear up to adults. We have U14 fields, but then also they have a league where adults play three-on-three. -three. And they'll play they'll play those on the small fields that the little kids play on. So, so it's. Larry, what position do you play? How many come out and watch? Referee. Uh, question I have on you have program guidelines, and I know that those are kind of voluntary, but some of them are more than voluntary. Maintain a complete financial package, et cetera, et cetera, that the city finance director can review the accounting procedures, make sure. Copacetic, and I, and I think that should not be a guideline. That should possibly be more as an obligation. But when I asked the old, the, about the age groups under six or six and younger, up to 10, 12, I can understand it. But when you start getting 12, 14, 16, every player plays at least 50% of every game. And I, and I think that's great. But are we handcuffing some coaches? I mean, can someone come back and say, hey, my kid only got to play for 10 minutes of the 40, and uh, you know, is that something that we should be saying? Well, some of them That's I think should be obligations. <laughs> yeah, but some of the guidelines I think should be an obligation, especially number seven. Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. But, okay, this is their association, though. Right. They're contractual, so. Yeah. And I think we kind of look at it as in lieu of a city recreational soccer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a child that comes only has one option where if you're in baseball, you have a competitive option, and then you have the city rec where we are able to ensure participation and stuff like that. So sort of part of the agreement, we can it sort of acts as our default recreation program. So something like 50% of every game, uh, you can cap it at an age if you want to, but it's pretty important. No, I agree, because especially the younger right. ones. But when you start yeah. getting the competitive stuff up in the teenagers right. and stuff and go to a high school basketball game, you're going to see some kids sure. sitting on the right. bench until right. they get to that mm -hmm. level. But on, once again, our program guidelines, specifically uh, number seven, uh, make those, it talks about all the records, breakdown fees, make those records available to the city finance director and city officials after each term and at the end of each season. Does that happen? It has in the past. Um, and I think it. that should be an obligation, not a guideline, because the guideline says we request that you do this. Yeah, I'm saying if you want to, it's written the way I read it. Yeah, if you want to do it, we, we, we think it's nice. But I think if we're going to have some, if it's under our auspices, even though it's not directly under our auspices, that should probably be uh, a, an obligation yeah. rather than a guideline. Under the rights and obligations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Or, that, that's or my opinion. But I mean, you guys that. study that, and you, the city manager, sure. you know, decide, and obviously the finance director, and determine if uh, you think that should have a little bit more teeth. Sure. Any other questions or discussion on this? If not, thank you very much. Okay. Next item, state byways interpretive sign placement. Okay. <laughs> Evening, Madam Mayor, Commissioners. I have been working with the uh, State Office of Tourism, Wildlife Parks and Tourism and that on a byways program, a signage uh, kiosk system for the whole state. 
And so, as, as you know, there's two byways that uh, come through Leavenworth and that, the Glacial Hills from here north, and then the historic Frontier Military Byway south. And so as part of that program, um, the state received a federal funding grant in 2014 to pursue this and that. And so we have been chosen as one of the sites where they would show or implement some kiosks here in town. <laughs> and so um, through discussion um, up until this point, we were leaning towards uh, Ray Miller Park and that as a site since there's already a, a sidewalk there and parking, off-site parking and that. So. I've invited uh, Sue Stringer here. She's the manager of the state uh, byways program, and that to kind of expand on it. And if anyone has any questions specific to the program, she would be happy to ask. Yes. Yes. Thank so. you very much for inviting me, Christy. And uh, I don't know if you know what a jewel you have in Christy. I worked with her when she was in Barnett and lived in Franklin County, and uh, was very pleased with mm -hmm. her work there. So she's she will do you well. Um, I have some handouts, and then I brought you some swag stuff too. So yeah. I don't know how you want to handle it. Little, little, yeah, a little bribery never um, hurts there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's Everybody just take literature. Note. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it probably I, I brought ten, so I know that there's too much. But if you want to hand it around, and it's kind of just a layout of the presentation that I want to give, and um, it is a slide, so. I understand I have a short amount of time, so I'm going to go through here this pretty quickly. I manage the Kansas Byways Program and the Kansas Agritourism Program for the state of Kansas. So it, it's a good fit for me. I'm a rural Franklin County girl. I was born in the country. Uh, I know how to, how to pull a calf with the best of them, <laughs> get cuckoo birds out, and everything else. So it, it's a good fit for me. First thing I want to do is show you, and it's in this packet, that little handout, is what the power of travel is in Kansas. Um, we get stats uh, every couple of years on what travelers bring to the state. And in Kansas, uh, the tourism industry is a $10 billion industry. So the byways program is a big formation of that. We have 12 byways in the state. Oops, let me get out of here. And um, the Governor and Secretary Jennison and Assistant Secretary Linda Craighead uh, base our tourism program on the 12 Kansas byways. We kind of put those as set points across the state. They're spread across the state. So the byways are a big deal. We market the byway communities different than we do any other communities in the state. And you'll see that through some of my slides. Um, we have two national scenic byways in, in, in Kansas. We have received federal highway grants and uh, national scenic highway grants, and now this last grant is a transportation alternative grant that we have received to do the interpretive project. One of the uh, things that uh, KDOT and Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks do with every byway is we put a kiosk on every byway once they are declared a byway. Frontier Military was actually legislated to be a byway many, many years ago, and we brought it into the byways program, so it's no longer within uh, the legislative body to where they can make any changes to it. It's within the program, and it's developed through state and local partnerships. Okay. This just shows where the 12 byways are across the state. You can see they're spread pretty good. I'm not hitting the right button. Up here? Okay. Thank you. We have the Kansas Byways Guide, and it's within your little packets. Um, we promote each one of the byways in that guide, and it's a publication that is funded through our agency and funds from the Kansas Department of Transportation. And we have uh, one of the ways that we market it is through our uh, travel or kansasbyways.com. So we feature each one of the byways individually, so you can. Uh, follow up, people, visitors can come to the site and see where it is to travel to. All 12 of the byways are there. We also have Facebook pages, but the, the part of the program is to preserve, protect, interpret, and promote the byway communities. So I'm just going to show you some pictures real quick that you all should be familiar with. Glacial Hill Scenic Byway runs from Leavenworth to White, White Cloud, and this is the arrows of it. 
I had to throw some agritourism in here. These are some more wonderful area agritourism businesses, Schwinn Barn, Lamborn Farms, and Providence Hill, and then the Blueberry Place that's run by a veteran, war veteran, that uh, helps people that are veterans come and be able to work on his farm. And I can't think of a name, I apologize. Anyway, just some more scenes of the beautiful glacial hills. Actually, uh, a friend of mine that lives at Potter took this picture with sunsets just a couple nights ago. So the Frontier Military Byway is the other byway that touches Leavenworth, and it runs from Leavenworth to Baxter Springs, Kansas. It's a big one. It was our longest byway in the state until Western Vistas came on. Um, people don't realize that we have the wonderful cemeteries here that they see uh, in D.C. And um, I just always like to show that. This is a confluence of the uh, rivers up at Cop Point. And then just some other pictures. Um, get into the interpretive plan a little bit. Uh, it was funded, uh, the plan development was funded by a federal highway grant in 2011 that we were awarded. Uh, KDOT did play, pay for that. It was an 80-20. We got the interpretation plan developed on a $500,000 grant and then we went to, wanted to implement it. Uh, we want to tell the stories of Kansas through the Byways program, and so that's where we come into the in interpretation. I applied for and received a transportation alternative grant from KDOT uh, through KDWPT. Uh, it's an 80-20, so KDWPT is putting up the 20% of this grant. We are in phase one, which is a creative design and location of the, the interpretive panels and updating the existing kiosks. Phase two will be fabrication and construction, and that will be with $814,000. This just shows you a little bit of what I've been doing. This is picking out all the interpretive sites of all of our byways, trying to make it equal and fair amongst them all. We have over 30 locations that we, we will be putting interpretation uh, on and about the byways. So when I look at that, I get nightmares. <laughs> This just shows a little bit of the interpretive panels, and you do have that, I think, in your handout. Now, the one that we're talking about that, to go into Ray Miller Park is going to look a little bit different. Initially, when we discussed this, we were talking about a kiosk, um, but um, it was felt that maybe that would be too obtrusive for the area. So this is how we do the interpret, how we are, they are proposing, RDG is our consultant, the interpretive panels look like with a little sidewalk and then uh, the, the three panels. The footprint of this is 20 feet, um, is about the size that that would take up. And then I had them work up today what, what we actually will be doing here in Leavenworth and Ray Miller Park with the sidewalk in the middle. Because you split two of the byways, Glacial Hills to the north and Frontier Military to the south, um, the discussion has been that we would put the Glacial Hills information, of course, on the north side of the sidewalk there in Ray Miller Park, and then the Frontier Military on the south side. The interpretations will tell the stories of the area. We have uh, five major themes, like Lang Land's Legacy, Past Forward, uh, First People, First Nations. There are great stories to tell in Kansas that people, some might be familiar with and others may not. This just shows the design. If you're an engineer, I'm sure you love it. Um, it just gives the dimensions, and the, again, that's in the handouts that you have of what the kiosks are gonna look like. And this is a, a, a board, a mock-up board for Glacial Hills. What type of interpretation would be on it? This is not a final. This is just how they showed us of the board space. This is a Barnes of Donovan County. Um, we are going to put additional kiosks along both byways, there will be one up at Troy uh, and one at uh, Dove Road in K7, I believe it is. Um, and then we will be doing the kiosk that is at White Cloud, redoing that kiosk. And the plans for that are in there. And um, this is a sign board of the welcome board. This board is across the state in rest areas. We will be redoing this. And this kind of gives you an idea of what the interpretive boards will look like. They are self-contained. I was telling you, there's no frames, there's no plexiglass over them. They are a piece, and that piece is where the storylines are on. It is a laminate material. It is of high quality. It 
should be vandal proof, but if somebody wants to take a sledge to it or run over it, um, they can do that. If something should happen to one of these interpretive boards, uh, if they are damaged belong, beyond being able to be kept up, um, it will be up to the state, KDOT and KDWPT, to replace those boards. We are just asking for permission with, with signatures that we can put these kiosks in, um, in your park. Uh, and I might mention, I have this written down on my sheet, um, we are looking at spending the, the kiosk or the interpretive panel areas um, will run about $27,000. Uh, we have talked with the city of Leavenworth and they have said that they would do some of the site prep work for us, which is just pretty much grubbing the ground, getting it ready for concrete. And then we'll have a consultant come in and install, install that. Um, we planned to go to Letting on July the 16th, but we have moved that date back to August the 16th, uh, giving time to get the agreement signed that we need to get signed to be able to come onto the properties to be able to do this construction. On the Glacial Hill Scenic Byway, uh, with what we're doing, the improvements will be about 43930 and Frontier Military, we will spend $34,905. Um, this shows what the interpretive panel, the panels will look like on the kiosk. On the existing one that's up at Glacial Hills, you can see this. It actually spent six weeks underwater uh, several years ago and came out looking pretty good. We did have to replace some of the uh, boarding on the inside, but the initial kiosk stood up the flooding well. Um, we're going to take these out. I can show it on there, but I can't do it here. We're going to take these panels out wider to take advantage of that roof so they're going to actually come clear out to the edge of each which will give more opportunity for words, pictures, for people to read and better use of that space. Again, it will be that high quality laminate. This is what the uh, kiosk will be updated with. The little square that you see on this right side that will be information that can be updated if need be. If we add another byway, then I don't have to replace the whole kiosk to say, now we have 13 byways. So I thought that that was a clever thing that they did with doing that. This shows the other side of the kiosk. They are two-sided. The kiosks are. The interpretive panels are one-sided. And then uh, part of the Frontier Military is a rest area that's down on, on KE 152 and US 69 down by Pleasanton. Um, if you notice, this says Frontier Military Scenic Byway. We did change the name to Frontier Military Historic Byway several years ago when we brought the historic byways into the program because we thought it was a much better fit, especially after US 69 became 75 miles an hour. You can't say that you can really see a lot of scenery at 75 miles an hour. <laughs> the idea of historic is you have to get out and investigate what the history is of these areas. So that's basically the byways program. Um, I hope that you will consider going ahead and signing that. Our legal department wanted to use the word easement because we will be coming onto your property, the city's property, to put these interpretive signs on. And they wanted to cover our agency by doing that. And so I would hope that you would see it as a benefit to put these interpretive boards in your community. Do you have any mm -hmm. questions? No. Mm -hmm. That's a great. No, yeah, yeah, it's really nice. Yeah. Oh, thank no, you. No, no, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. I've given so many agritourism presentations early. <laughs> like this. By the way, Leavenworth County is one of the premier counties for agritourism in the state. I love what you guys have for agritourism and that you are welcoming uh, people that have farms uh, that want to diversify their operation to bring extra mm -hmm. funds into their, to save their farm, to keep their kids on their farm. Yeah. It, it's great. Um, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this will be brought back to the commission meeting for signing or Sorry. just a consensus we want to give you the authority to bring it back to um, 
so there's right. actual agreement that we need to sign? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next week we can yeah, bring the yeah, agreement next week. Okay. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, review of uh, stormwater policy and funding sources. Madam Mayor and Commission, I'll kick this off, and we also have our public, public works director, deputy public works director. Um, at the May second study session, we identified um, a backlog of somewhere along the uh, lines of forty to seventy million dollars of stormwater problems, primarily due to aging infrastructure, and then also uh, techniques, construction techniques in the '80s that um, aren't holding up as well as uh, we'd hoped at the time. Uh, this dates back well into the 90s, the idea of some sort of dedicated stormwater system funding source. Um, it's been kicked around since the 90s, um, and, but nothing has been put in, put in place. The commission did express a consensus in uh, continuing to look at this. Um, again, this is uh, the second and what will be a handful of study sessions before anything were to happen. What we're looking for tonight, um, following the consensus to look at something like this, is to sort of narrow in on a structure. Uh, the numbers that you have in your policy report are essentially meaningless. Don't pay attention to $3 a month, 550 a month. They're just used to illustrate the type of structure. We've narrowed it into three broad structures, and among those structures, there can be variations in numbers, multipliers, and such. But we wanted to sort of present the three structures tonight and get your input. Um, so briefly going through them, um, and I should mention that Mike and Mike have done a, a, a thorough review of Kansas cities and what they do and how they implement it um, uh, to get some best practices. And, and what we found is that uh, very rarely do two cities do it the same way. So there's a lot of flexibility depending on how it best fits your community. So the first sort of structure that we have um, is we, we've called it a simple set rate formula. That's where you would assign a residential uh, per month um, amount and the non-residential per month amount. This is the simplest way to enact this type of uh, fee. Um, you could do it monthly or you could do it at the end of the year, but the, the crux of it is there's one uh, amount for residential and one for non-residential. Regardless uh, of the size. Of regardless the of the size. Um, and, and as it mentions there, this method, method is the easiest to implement, uh, differentiates between residential and non-residential. However, it does lack the ability to differentiate between large and small non-residential, um, which uh, then adds a, a variable. So you're, if you want to add that variable, you get into the second set, which is a set rate um, with the introduction of, of a multiplier. The multiplier most traditionally used is called an ERU, or an equivalent residential unit. That's an average amount of square footage of impermeable area in your city. So it varies the, uh, based on um, the type of properties you have in your community. So in this, um, for most the, the cities that use this, Atchison, Topeka, Hayes, Hutchison, uh, and so forth, the single family residents would continue with the simple set rate formula, $4 a month, $3 a month, whatever the commission should choose. And then the multifamily, commercial, industrial would start at that base rate and then there would be a multiplier based on their size. If they were below one ERU, you would round up and it'd be one, so it would stay at that $4. Now you could also have it be five, six, seven, whatever the set rate is. Um, but then you start to account for larger uh, apartment complexes, industrial uses, large commercial, where if they were over a certain square footage of impermeable area, you would multiply by two, three, four, depending on the size of those. Again, you can structure that um, uh, into a two-tier system where either they're small or big, you can have a three-tier system. Um, but all this we want to focus on tonight is that the second set introduces a multiplier. The third is uh, all over the map. And, and what I mean by that is it, it gets complex where you can do a per property assessment of impermeable area. It takes a lot of work, it's complex, um, uh, a lot of variables involved in this. Uh, Lawrence does this. Um, in this, you would essentially establish ERUs uh, or something like that for both residential and non-residential. Um, you could do it that way. You could do it uh, by exact square footage and come up with 20 tiers if you wanted to. You can make it as complex or, or not as you, as you so choose. Um, so we've sort of given you, and, and I'll open up for questions here in a second, we've, we've tried to give, we've tried to group the 30 different ways that you can do this into sort of three broad categories and the hope would be if we did kind of come to a consensus then we would bring back uh, more information on each of those categories. 
So this third one, that is so, I, when I was reading this before, I was trying to figure out, is that, so if you have a, a larger lot, you're going to pay more. It's not it just a, your house. It, it's it's square it's footage and impermeable area. Does that mean your driveways, foundation, your footprint? Um, okay. Yeah. okay. But uh, further to that question, are you done? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Let's say I've got a 2,000 square foot house, split entry, you know, with a regular driveway. And let's say the footprint on a 2,000 square foot split entry house, maybe 1,000 square foot. But let's say I have a 2,000 square foot ranch house. Right. My footprint is 2,000. Am I? Interpreting that correctly. Mm -hmm. If I have a two thousand square foot house on, on a slab, for the most I've got, part, yeah, yes. I'm gonna pay the two thousand rate, well, I've got a two thousand square foot on a split entry, I'm gonna pay the one thousand yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's done on the okay. aerial it's done okay. on aerial view. Your okay. Right. footprint on the property takes in the building footprint as well as the sidewalks, the patios, the driveways. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Within the lot confines. So if you got a really big lot, like my lot's pretty good size, then I would be paying more. No, 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 it's it's not the lot. It's your house and your driveway where there's oh, no dirt. It's, yeah, it's, where they can't it's grass areas. The non-porous no surfaces, so it is, yeah, it or rain, yeah, yeah. 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 If you have yes. a really huge yard, yeah, grass and all that, you're not paying more money. Okay, start, got it. Start building six, six-story houses. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That doesn't seem fair to me. And, and, the, and the more complex they get, the more you start leaning toward a, a, a something that's mailed out annually with your taxes rather than a monthly yeah. you know, mm -hmm. associated with yeah. your utilities. It's be expensive. Mm -hmm. to yeah, I'm in favor. I know we need to do something. But I read through the policy report, too, and I'm also familiar with the last time this was proposed. And I'm going to say let's stick with the most simplest. I agree. Yep. way to do it is going to eliminate feedback from our general public, mm -hmm. from the commercial industry, from the industrial industry. We're sitting here crying for businesses. There would be no way in the world I would vote for number three. Right. Uh, look at, at Zex. They just put five acres or six acres of blacktop down mm -hmm. using this in their parking lot. Hey, you, you'd probably be up for two, three thousand dollars a month. Uh, yeah, and it does it in, in, with our standards roof. now they handle a lot of their water on site we right. we require yeah, that on the front end and the fair mm -hmm. right. end and yeah mm -hmm. so and, uh, there are a lot of these places are you know required to do it mm -hmm. the other thing on that is that we require an impervious surface to park on anybody that has a vehicle if you store a boat it's got to be on an impervious surface right so we're sort of generating our own money which i disagree with yeah. 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 There's something to be said for most of all of them that there's issues. Uh, yeah, after sure. reading through these, but, you know, I, I think would the stay first with the simplest, simplest and the cheapest possible mm -hmm. to get by. That, yeah, I think you did number three. Problems. You'd probably have to hire if one and a half people, people just to manage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the second one too. Yeah. yeah. That was my question too. If we went with three. You're, you're looking at a staff person in, mm -hmm. in her out. office for, yeah, or, you know, to, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. for sure. And the implement, yeah, the, so that kind of just adds to the cost of it, yeah, keep it going. I would like to see a recommendation brought back to us uh, that you know, sets a simple, and if you're that we want a simple formula, and now bring back to us a simple formula. Yeah. yeah because you're not bringing the formula right now. I said, here are the three options, and we're saying. Yeah. Is, yeah. is there a, a, a sense of if it would be something that would be mailed out essentially like you know, with, uh, say, co billed with your water and your sewer bill or a, an annual thing that would feed it would be on your taxes? Because uh, that's the big difference between those yeah. two is if it's mailed out with, uh, well, the water bills will, will catch anybody that's a water customer at Sewer Mary College or churches and such uh, right. so uh, but that's but they still have to pay yeah, they still have yeah, to pay. Right. yeah. yeah. one thing we did find in all but one of the cities is they do collect on the tax exempt properties yeah right. well yeah it's not a tax right. you know it's it's right. they're yeah. tax they're free on the tax. this right. is not a tax so right. so if so. you did it in the water bill those properties that don't have water yeah, and conceptually, you could look at, say, the Zex new parking lot and say they don't have a water meter, they would not be assessed a fee. But they, they have their own pond and stuff, that, which is, is a nuance. But 
the water meter, the water belt, water sewer line is really the easiest way to reach out and get 90 plus percent of the people that have impervious areas. Well, the I think there's very little property that comes under this purview that doesn't have a meter and let them work it. Right, but you, you could have your, uh, your storage, uh, say your mini storages or uh, a house that's vacant, vacant. Uh, mm -hmm. that the water's turned off. There, there are instant, it's, there's always somebody out there that's probably got an impervious area that would not get a bill for storage. Well, I can see it on a, on a changing basis, but not on a permit, but other than your storage facility. That'd probably be the only business I can think of that doesn't have a water meter either. Or there, you guys probably can think of more. <coughs> yeah, Zach has a water meter. They got water yeah. down through the building. A tow lot. Flush the toilets and drink. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a tow lot, maybe a mini storage. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah there's probably Anything some. Anything yeah. to do storage. Yeah. 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 Cars there could be or some discrepancies water. on the Mulberry family because some of your duplexes have one water meter. Yes. Some of your uh, apartments have one water meter. Some of them have. But somebody's paying there. that water meter bill. Somebody's paying that water bill. Yeah, right. I mean, it's yeah. Right. Landlord yeah. Or the yeah, a lot of times that's a landlord pay yeah. if they provide the water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but they obviously that money would still be collected from right. Right. Yeah. And the six. The other general the accepted alternative is like we would go out with your property tax statement all mm -hmm. and get mm -hmm. uh, one bill all at once. Um, well, it would catch every property then, wouldn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. that's what, from a finance standpoint, what's the What's we're we're gonna get ninety five percent if uh, we do it on the water. We'll get ninety eight percent if we do it on the taxes. And some people don't pay their taxes. We know that. But uh, from a finance standpoint, what's the easiest way to manage this thing? From it's not quite an enterprise fund, but some yeah, they an both they both come to us. The property tax is collected by the county comes to us, and the 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 bill is collected by the water department. Yeah. Um, we do pay an admin fee, a pretty substantial admin fee on that, but um, but I don't know unless Ruby has a compelling uh, argument. I mean, they're relatively similar as far as collection. I think that our, our, our collection on Ruby's property recommendation yeah. on yeah. the simplest and how to handle it. Well, it's really kind of a, so uh, so how, <laughs> how you would think that people would uh, want to receive that. We, we collect 97% of property tax is, is mm -hmm. our collection rate. Um, so pretty good and the water the kicker is if you don't pay your water bill you get your water turned off so yeah, I, mean, I mean both of them have a pretty high collection rate yeah. yeah and I would agree that the simplest method of tracking would be the number one method of the where you're talking about the residential and non-residential fees mm -hmm. as far as tracking would probably be the simplest was that the water meter mm -hmm. yes yeah I agree oh so you're right man do it on the water bill monthly rather than annually on the tax bill. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you, on the ones that we're discussing, like the uh, storage facilities and, and whatnot, bill them independently? We could discuss that. That's certainly an option if, if we see that that's a, a large component. Would, we don't know what we're talking about here because we right. don't know how many there are. So right. if we had <clears throat> some idea of that, then yeah, actually, yeah, some examples would be yeah. good too, just to see what the impact on people are going to be versus a house, small house versus maybe a commercial apartment building too. Okay. So did you want so to focus on the, the residential rate, non-residential rate minus the multipliers and, and yes. be brought back then? Okay. Yes. Based off of and the, example, the first we'll example. Give us more information. Yeah, and we, you know, we owe uh, a sort of an idea of a program of work we you know we'll put some numbers together we'll put a lot more data to it now that we're able to right. focus on how much money you, structure. Are you, do you think that we need to raise annually uh, i don't i don't want to talk about bring that up quite no, yet okay. we're not i don't think we're at a point where we're because we have what 9500 residences in town don't we 9800 whatever yeah, 1200 rooftops so 1200 12000 12,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is Leavenworth, not Bonner Springs. Yes, yeah. I think the most important thing is to show that um, we're ready and, and able to to adequately use or appropriately use the funds. So we got okay. some work to do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That'd be good. Thank you so much. This is very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Next item on the agenda, personnel policy update, recruiting and hiring. Okay. Uh, Madam Mayor and Commission, uh, as stated in your policy report, uh, nearly all the rules and regulations that govern how the city operates its personnel system are contained in the personnel policy manual. Um, the one caveat to that is Chapter 82 of the Code of Ordinances, which establishes uh, what's commonly referred to as the Civil Service Commission. Um, the Civil Service Commission uh, was implemented in the 60s and really revised in the 80s, um, and it's a pretty rigid system that, that primarily does two things, and it does more than that, but primarily two. It sets how the city uh, recruits and hires employees. Um, that is governed by the Civil Service Commission. It gives them great latitude to institute rules, to even dismiss candidates should they choose. Now, it doesn't operate that way, but that's what the language gives it the uh, authority to do. Um, it indicates that department heads can only see um, five applications at a time. Um, there's, uh, there's a ranking system. There's, it's, a, it's a very uh, rigid system that's, that's pretty outdated. The second thing it does is the Civil Service Commission acts as a grievance board. Should an employee be terminated, they can um, appeal to the department director. Should that be denied, they can appeal to the city manager. That can be denied. And through the system that we have, which is pretty unique among cities, um, I couldn't find another one, you can appeal that to then to the Civil Service Commission. Um, eliminating Chapter 82, uh, my primary goal was to get rid of the recruitment and hiring system. Um, but while we're doing that, we've talked to the Civil Service Commission Chairman, the Employee Council, uh, Department Directors, and we feel that uh, eliminating the entire ordinance is probably the easiest thing to do rather than picking and choosing. Um, this does not eliminate an employee's ability, obviously, to avail themselves of all measures that they seem fit should they feel they were terminated uh, uh, without cause or in violation of programs and policies. So the reason this is brought to you um, is that the commission obviously has to vote uh, on by ordinance to repeal um, city, city ordinances. And the second part is the commission also approves changes to the personnel policy. So if we're going to get rid of this, we have to then... Um, institute this uh, a more flexible, modern um, system within the personnel policy. Uh, I didn't want to bring that to the commission without a consensus that, uh, of, of being willing to look at repealing Chapter 82. Um, the new system is, uh, the applications still come into HR, but the design essentially would then put the responsibility for developing a program for hiring on the department head. Departments, police, fire function completely differently than uh, planning or public works or parks, um, but everybody's bound by the same system at this time. Um, it's it's a pretty burdensome process on HR. They have to score everything. Um, it, it has a couple other new features about being able to create waiting lists for hard to fill positions so that should we fill it and then three months later a vacancy come up or even up to, you know, I can't remember, I think it's six months in this, you can grab uh, people who are qualified off previous lists and um, for even positions with the same qualifications, you could uh, hire somebody off uh, another list, say a project manager and a, uh, an engineering tech too, if they had the same qualification. So the goal here is to make uh, the process faster, more efficient, more tailored to, to individual departments. So yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the idea. emphasis behind the two measures here. Um, and we, we did wanna, we talked to all the department heads, talked to the employee council, talked to representatives from police and fire, about all the uh, ramifications of revoking Chapter 82. So that would be my recommendation. Lana knows Chapter 82 better than I do and the personnel policy manual, so if you have any questions, she can answer them. But uh, our goal would then be to sort of run these two processes concurrently, but allow you to review the new um, right. draft policy um, uh, as we move along. Okay. I've got a couple of questions. If I'm understanding correctly, and if I read it correctly, we're completely repealing civil service. Is that correct? Okay. Those that have been hired under civil service, will they still retain the same protection under the new policy once civil service is abandoned? They would not. The Civil Service Board Commission would be abolished. Right. So it's, if the only thing that would affect an existing employee, well, is an internal hire, but then the main one is is the civil service board grievance process, and that would not be available. That would be there would be no civil service commission anymore, no civil service board. It's and been used very infrequently. Yeah, we've had in my 13 years here, we've had three, um, 
Well, I understand that, but I was right. just, just checking on the uh, And we were, we were very leery there. about that, the appearance that the employees were losing a, a safeguard, um, but it's been very infrequent, and they still have all the regular standard grievance processes, and, you know, including uh, any legal remedies. I think especially on the hiring part, there's been a lot of obstacles with that, so. Yeah, with that's. The current system, no, I agree. Yeah, that, that, that's where it's the most burdensome. Yeah, yeah it just, yeah. And simplify it, mm -hmm. yeah. Maintain our quality, we're, mm -hmm. we're far better off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have some internal controls in mind. Uh, every department head will uh, fill out a one page after action report on a hire. What process did you use? How many people did you interview? So we can keep an eye on. Um, any potential uh, somebody shortcutting the system. Sure. So we'll, we'll definitely keep an eye on that, especially, you know, the first year or two that we implement it. Okay. Um, I, I'm fine with repealing Chapter 82, and I look forward to seeing any changes. Well, I am, too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I agree. I'll bring us into that. Thank you. Okay. Modern age. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Next item is the Business and Technology Park update. Madam Mayor Commission, I just wanted to give the uh, Commission and the public, whoever may be watching or reading the paper tomorrow, an update on where we are with the business park. Um, on Tuesday, May 30th, the City opened proposals for the Shovel Ready Business and Technology Park. We did receive one submission from JMK Partners, LLC. The site they selected is the 80 acres immediately adjacent to the Gary Carlson Park. Uh, we did have multiple firms uh, download a packet from Drexel Tech with just the one submission. Um, staff has determined that the proposal is in full compliance with the request, um, and we've already started working on um, a draft development agreement. Um, I have also met with the Water Department. Um, the Water Department had agreed in principle on the uh, Port Authority's incarnation of this project to donate a water line. That uh, process ceased, and this is a brand new project, so that request has to be made again in full. So if you'll see the, the proposal from J&K, it looks like it's about a million dollars more. Well, that includes a $900,000 water line. Okay. So um, I'm on the agenda for the June 12th Water Board meeting, where I'll um, request that same uh, deal that, that they had in place with the Port Authority. Um, and we will continue to work on development agreement, which of course will come to the Commission. We hope to have that as early as next week, um, potentially the, the 27th of June, but but this month, um, I hope to be able to get going as quick as possible. Great. Okay. So any questions you have on the business and technology part, uh, feel free to ask them. No, I don't. Thank you for all your hard work. No, no questions, yeah. just anxious to get going. <laughs> just, uh, you did mention three or four other companies did pull packets, mm -hmm. and I know they didn't submit Anybody do any follow up? Just curious as why they didn't submit. I didn't. Anybody or anybody hear anything through the grapevine or anything else? They just didn't do it. Okay. Okay. Are there any other items of discussion this evening? No. Uh, if not, we don't need a motion, so we'll adjourn. Yep. Yeah.